James's response was predictable. He has received substantial cash, gifts from his parents throughout his adult life. He needed an annual gift equivalent to about 20% of his income to cover his annual expenses. He viewed his parents' idea of giving their capital to the call leg as a threat to his future income. Like many other gift receivers, James views himself as self-made. In fact, about two of every three adult children who receive significant cash gifts periodically from their parents view themselves as members of the I Did It On My Own club. We are amazed when these people tell us in interviews we earned every dollar we have. Three, gift receivers are S-I-G-N-I-F-I-C-A-N-T-L-Y-M-O-R-E-D-E-P-E-N-D-E-N-T-O-N-C-R-E-D-I-T-T-H-A-N-R-1 receivers. Those who receive periodic gifts of cash or its equivalent are euphoric about their economic well-being. Euphoria of this type is related to their need to spend money, but much of this money is not in hand. It is tomorrow's economic outpatient care. So how do gift receivers respond to this dilemma? They use credit vehicles to smooth out their problems with cash flow. Why wait for the windfall at the end of the rainbow? Adult children who receive cash gifts are more likely than other adult children to live in anticipation of the sizable inheritance eventually coming their way. In spite of having only about 91% of the total household annual income and 81% of the net worth of non-receivers of gifts, gift receivers are significantly more likely to be credit-oriented. This credit is obtained for consumption, not investment, purposes. Conversely, non-receivers of gifts borrow more for investment purposes than do gift receivers. Otherwise, in nearly every conceivable type of credit product service category, gift receivers outpace non-receivers. This applies both to the incidence of credit usage and to the actual dollars spent to pay the interest on outstanding balances. It applies to personal loans and to unpaid balances on credit card loans. Gift receivers and non-receivers are not significantly different in their use of mortgage services or in the allocation of dollars for such purposes. However, a significant portion of the gift receivers were given money for sizable down payments on their homes. For receivers of GIFTS invest much less money than do non-receivers. When surveyed, gift receivers reported that they invested less than 65 percent of what non-receivers invested each year. Even this is a very conservative estimate since like most heavy credit users, gift receivers overestimate the amount of money they invest. For example, they often forget to take into account major credit purchases when computing, actual consumption, and investing habits. There are exceptions to this rule. Teachers and professors who Receive gifts appear to remain as frugal or even more so than those who receive no gifts. They are much more likely to save and invest the money they receive as gifts than are gift receivers in other occupational categories. The issue of teachers and professors as role models is this. Cuss it more fully later in the chapter. As we have made clear, gift receivers are hyper-consumers and credit-prone. They live well above the norm for others with comparable incomes, but often people mistakenly believe that gift receivers are concerned solely with their own desires, needs, and interests. This is not the case. On average, gift receivers donate significantly more to charity than do others in the same income categories. For example, gift. Receivers who have annual household incomes in the $100,000 category normally donate just under 6% of their annual incomes to charitable causes. The general population in this income category donates only about 3%. Gift receivers give in proportions that are much like those of households with annual incomes in the $200,000 to $400,000 bracket. These people give approximately 6% of their income to noble causes. Noble or not, 
Gift receivers consume more, so they have signify. Can't leave less money to invest. What good does it do to be well-versed in? Investment opportunities when one has little or no money to invest. This is the situation in which a young professor of business recently found himself. He, a gift receiver, was asked to teach a course on investing for a continuing education program. His audience included many well-educated, high-income people. The professor discussed various topics, including sources of investment information and how to evaluate the stock offerings of various public corporations. The professor received high praise from his audience. He was well-trained in his discipline. He held a PhD in business administration with a concentration in finance. However, near the end of the course, a gen. Clement from the audience asked the professor a simple question. Doctor, E, may I ask about your personal portfolio? What do you invest in? His answer surprised most of the class. I don't have much of a portfolio at present. I'm too involved with paying two mortgages and auto loan tuition. Later, a member of the class told us, it's like the fellow who wrote the book on 100. Clever things to say to attractive women. But the guy did not know any good-looking women. Why don't the financial advisors of under-accumulating gift receivers emphasize thrift in their messages? All too often, financial advisors have a narrow focus. They sell investments and investment advice. They don't teach thrift and budgeting. Many find it embarrassing, even degrading, to suggest to clients that their lifestyle is too high. In fairness, many high-income individuals as well as their advisors have no idea how much net worth someone should have, given certain income and age parameters. Additionally, financial advisors are often unaware that their clients receive sizable cash gifts each year. Relying solely on a client's earned income statement, they may likely say, well, Bill, for a fellow who is 44 years of age and who earns $70,000 annually, you're doing pretty well. Pretty well in terms of your lovely home, boat, foreign luxury auto, mobiles, donations, and even your investment portfolio. Would the same advisor feel this way if Bill told him about the tax-free cash gift of $20,000 he receives each year from mom and dad? It is important here to emphasize a point made throughout this book. Not all adult children of the affluent become UAWs. Those who do tend to have parents who heavily subsidize their children's standard of living. But many other sons and daughters of affluent parents become paws. The evidence suggests this happens when their parents are frugal and well-disciplined and instill these values as well as in dependence in their children. The popular press often paints a different picture. Too often they tout the Abe Lincoln stories. They dramatize those cases in which a child from a blue-collar background became very successful. They pro veed anecdotal evidence that the discipline of being poor is a prerequis. Cite to becoming a millionaire in America. If that were true, one would expect there to be at least 35 million millionaire households in America today. But we know that there is only about one-tenth that number. It is true that most millionaires are the sons and daughters of non-millionaire parents, since the non-millionaire population is more than 30 times larger than its counterpart. Only a generation ago, it was more than 70 times larger. The enormous size of the non-millionaire population has a great deal to do with why most millionaires come from non-millionaire households. As a probability statement, millionaires are more likely to give birth to millionaires. Accordingly, the odds of becoming a millionaire are lower for individuals who are the products of non-millionaires. A teacher and A, an attorney, a case study. Henry and Josh are brothers, but having the same parents does not mean that these two people are similar. Henry is 48 years of age. Josh is 46. Henry is a high school math teacher. Josh is an attorney and a partner in a modest-sized law firm. 
The brothers are two of six children born to millionaires Burl and Susan, who accumulated their money by operating a successful con. Tracting firm. The couple has always been generous with their children. Each year they have given Henry and Josh and their other son and daughters approximately $10,000 in cash. This gift giving did not stop. When their sons and daughters became adults, Burl and Susan felt that such gifts would help reduce the size of their estate and thus reduce the inheritance tax their children would have to pay someday. Burl and Susan also wanted to help their adult children get a good start in life. They felt that financial gifts would help their children all tie, mainly become financially independent. Burl and Susan were always democratic about distributing their wealth to their children. Each adult child received the same size cash gift each year. In addition, each child was given approximately the same amount of money to help purchase a first home. One might expect that the children in such families would become financially independent. Certainly, Burl and Susan felt this way. They always assumed that they themselves would have been even more as you see. Successful if they had attended college and subsequently received cash gifts from their parents. But their parents on both sides were poor. Burl and Susan were successful because their parents gave them something other than money. Each was the product of a disciplined home life. Burl and Susan were not only well-disciplined, they also taught themselves how to deal with adversity, and adversity made them what they are today. Successful millionaires. Tough times in the contracting business drive. Out the weak and unproductive. Burl and Susan were never weak of heart and always ran a highly productive, low-cost operation. This applied to both their business and their household. Even today, this couple has never owned a luxury automobile. They have never been on skis, never traveled abroad, nor have they ever joined a country club, but somehow they assumed that if their adult children could be exposed to the wisdom gained from college, travel, abroad, and associating with higher status people in general that they would outperform their parents economically. Burl and Susan were wrong in making such assumptions. The chill, dren of affluent parents don't automatically perform as well as their parents in terms of accumulating wealth. This is not to say that the Henrys and Joshes of America will never outpace their parents. Some do, but they're a minority among all the children of the affluent. It's important to note that the children of affluent parents have, in today's dollars, about a one in five chance of accumulating wealth in the seven figures during their lifetimes, while the average child in this country whose parents are not millionaires has about a one in 30 chance. Are any of the children of Burl and Susan millionaires today? No, but one is more likely to become a member of the seven-figure net worth club soon. Will it be Henry or Josh or one of the other children? Burl and Susan's other children are considerably younger than Henry and Josh. Certainly age is a correlate of wealth accumulation. Young adults are not likely to have accumulated considerable wealth on their own. Also, the other four children have not been receiving economic outpatient care from their parents for the same length of time as their older brothers. Many observers might predict that Josh would more likely accumulate a seven-figure level of net worth before his brother. It is certainly understandable that they would feel this way. Attorneys typically generate significantly higher incomes than high school teachers. Once again, income is highly correlated with wealth accumulation. Last year, Henry's total household income, NQT including the gift of cash from Burl and Susan, was $71,000, Josh's cash $123,000. One would assume, just from these figures, that Josh would be much more likely to accumulate wealth. After all, his income is nearly twice that of his brother's. But observers who make such predictions overlooked the fundamental rule regarding wealth building. Whatever your income, always live below your means. Henry, in spite of his smaller salary, lives below his means. 
Josh, on the other hand, lives substantially above his income. In fact, Josh really counts on that $10,000 from dad and mom to keep in balance. The $10,000 added to his $123,000 income places him in the top 4% of all income-producing households in America. Remember that approximately 3.5% of the households in America have a net worth of $1 million or more. But Josh has a net worth that, even optimistically estimated, is well beneath that figure. His total net worth, including the equity in his home, law partnership, pension, and other assets is $553,000. How about Henry? In spite of his much smaller income, Henry has accumulated significantly more wealth. Stated conservatively, his net worth is $834,000. How is it possible for a teacher to have so much more wealth than an attorney with nearly twice the income? Stated simply, Henry and his wife are frugal, Josh and his wife are heavy consumers.